Today we're going to be talking about user experience design. Let's recap user experience. Remember the honeycomb from the user experience researcher PowerPoint. UX is the user's overall experience with a product that can begin long before and sustain long after the actual interaction with the product. It can contain many facets from usability to desirability and anything in between. Often when we talk about UX, we're referring to websites and smartphone apps, but it can apply way more broadly. Let's look at some of the strengths of a UX designer. First, staying on top of deadlines. Like the other jobs involved in the product lifecycle, UX designers are working on different projects or sub-projects at one time, many of which are in different stages along the development process. Similar to the last bullet, managing many projects and tasks at once. UX designers can also sometimes spend a lot of time in training and workshops, which makes their actual working time each week even shorter. Thus, the need for excellent organization skills is critical. Educating colleagues on design principles. The best UX designers help their colleagues understand not just that something is a good decision, but the psychology behind why something is a good decision. Good presentation skills. Not only for education, but they must also present designs to other colleagues in design reviews, as well as up to management at times. Being able to defend and justify decisions based on data, not just opinion. In a room full of people, everyone will have a different opinion on design, and in this case, how do you know who's right? This is why making data-driven decisions is key. And last but not least, traits like drawing, creativity, and thinking outside the box. Speaking of the product lifecycle, UX design lives somewhere between research and coding. Designers use insight from UX researchers to help shape requirements and solutions. They know that internally, their first audience will be product managers and other stakeholders, such as sales and customers, things like that. Once a design has been vetted for usability, they then pass it off to the development team, and of course, they'll have to provide notes for interactions, special circumstances, specs like font size, and more. If you're considering becoming a UX designer, know that a typical day might include brainstorming, designing, and refining interfaces and other solutions, communicating ideas, designs, finding issues, and, and having questions both written and verbal, having meetings with colleagues to understand their challenges and their priorities, conducting workshops with customers to understand their needs and their work environment, usability testing prototypes with end users, this is actually the user researcher typically conducting the test, but the usability designer or the UX designer is usually watching somewhere nearby. Creating deliverables like ad banners, email content, and things like that. So you might not just be creating software interfaces, but other things that are going to be visible on the screen. Attending and or presenting learning opportunities it could be within the organization or outside of it, like for a conference. And finally, adhering to company-wide best practices and visual or interaction standards. If it's not obvious yet, UX design means working with lots of different people. Of course, there's product and business to understand the idea and fully flesh it out, developers to make sure that the thing that's coded has been implemented the right way, other UX designers, because if you're working on a large enough project, you may be working with multiple people to get the work done, or sometimes you just need a second pair of eyes to make sure you're not going crazy, of course, UX researchers to make sure that your ideas are usable and that users enjoy using them. Marketing and sales so that they understand everything they need to know to then sell the idea. And technical writers need to be able to document whatever you're building. Notice that one of the first tools I mentioned on the last slide was a whiteboard. 
This is used to do low fidelity or low detail sketches of ideas before committing to them. We discussed this more thoroughly in the design thinking presentation, but ultimately we want to make sure that we validate ideas broadly before spending a lot of time and money finalizing the details of what's ultimately a bad idea. The other reason that we want to make sure we do lots of sketching, and this can include lots of members of the team, not just UX designer, is that a quantity of ideas leads to the quality of ideas because when we have a quantity, that's when we can validate which ideas are good and which ideas aren't good, and this will allow us to refine only the good ideas. I mentioned a moment ago uh, the word prototyping. Prototyping is just a very common task done by UX designers. There's a few different levels of prototyping, by which we mean just sketching out a general concept that you see on the left. In the middle, we see a low fidelity prototype where the team hasn't thought out every detail, but they have some idea of the interactions they want the user to take, and they want to make sure they're heading in the right direction before they spend too much more time on the details um, and getting every little pixel right. And on the right, we have the high fidelity prototype which can be as detailed and interactive as an actual working software. Prototyping can be done in different ways, but typically UX designers will use a software specifically dedicated to usability pro prototyping, or they might do light HTML and CSS. And somewhere between low fidelity prototyping and high fidelity prototyping is typically what ends up in the usability lab. And I love this quote, if you think good design is expensive, you should see the cost of bad design. And that's from the CEO of Jaguar. Next, we're going to talk about typography and colors. So this is just a quick example of two elements of visual design that UX designers must understand and use wisely. So if this section is interesting to you, you might be cut out to be a UX designer. And if you have any more questions, you should definitely talk to your instructor. We're going to start by talking about typography. Now, I've got the same word written out here uh, twice, the word text, but it looks different on both halves. And that's because on the left, that's a serif font or a serif typeface, and on the right it's a sans serif, sans meaning without. And I've got circled these little hooks or feet that stand out from the words, and those are the actual serifs themselves. So if a, if a letter has these little hooks or feet hanging off of the ends, then it's a serif font. And if it's straight and just kind of ends very, uh, uh, is very rigid and straight like on the right, then that would be a sans serif. Some differences between them, on the left, the serifs are a little bit more traditional. Typically, it's reserved for things like books and printed documents, although that's not a hard and fast rule. It's just kind of a general way to use that text. Um, on the right, the sans serif, it is more modern. It's very good for things like headings and titles, regardless of if it's print or digital. Um, and sans serif typography tends to be easier to read on the web primarily because the small details of the serifs do not get blurred by the light coming through the screen monitors. And it's not necessarily that sans serif is always one you know, better or worse than serif or vice versa. Um, different types of needs just call for different things, but ultimately what we always want to go for is that typography is easy to read. So notice on the left we've got a typeface that has a very rational proportion and it's very easy to read. On the right, the font is very wide. All the letters are kind of uppercase and lowercase blending together the same height. And ultimately, it makes it harder to read. That's not to say that you can't ever use it. It might work as a display typeface or to make an impact in a very short, condensed uh, amount of words. Um, but typically, you'll want to know which types of font are easier to read or hard to read. Um, another example of that is, you've, again, we've got something very kind of plain and simple to read on the left versus a script font. Script fonts definitely have their place in society. You'll often see them on things like invitations or, or kind of formal stationery, and you'll see them on the web um, or printed as well, but you'll see it maybe less often there. And we just want to be aware of, of when it's appropriate to use and when it's not as appropriate. Additionally, there's uh, lots of display typefaces. Um, th there are, of course, exceptions where you do want to have a display typeface. Notice here, they're, they're, these are used well in a lot of different ways, a lot of logos or headlines or billboards or things that are printed very large might be a display typeface, which is not necessarily serif or sans serif because it's just a little bit too different and unique to fit into either category. Um, just exercise caution when choosing a display typeface and make sure that you don't have it uh, carrying on for too long. You want it to be something that is short, maybe as a call to action or, or some kind of tagline that you want people to take away. 
All right, and I mentioned that we were going to talk about color as well. So color, of course, if you're going to be using color, you need to be aware of the color wheel and know how the relationships all work together. So any color comes from variations of mixing blue, red, and yellow, which are the primary colors. Um, black is all colors combined together, and so the darker a color is, the more colors have been combined to make that color. And then white is the absence of color at all. Um, and so, and color does also appear on a spectrum. It's not necessarily, um, it, it is something that kind of has fluidity and can have a range. Um, but it's just important to know, you know, you've got your primary colors, your secondary colors appear in between those on the color wheel, and then your tertiary colors appear between those as well. Um, and the difference between shade and hue as well is very, is very important for designers to know. It's also very important for uh, designers to know how to use color to drive behavior because color isn't just pretty to look at. Uh, so for example, we've got red, green, and yellow traffic lights. This color scheme derives from a system used by the railroad industry since the 1830s. They created a lighting method to let train engineers know when to stop or go with different lighted colors representing different actions. It's thought that they chose red as the color for stop because red has for centuries been used to indicate danger. Um, but for other colors, they chose white to go uh, as they chose white to go, and for green as caution. However, the white caused a lot of problems. Like for example, in 1914, the red lens fell out of its holder, leaving the white light behind it exposed, and so people that should have been seeing a red light actually saw a white light. Uh, this ended up with a train running a stop signal and crashing into another train. And so that railroad decided to change it so that the green light meant go and caution meant yellow. And now it's the color associations that we have today. Um, but since these associations are so strong within our society, um, if you're ever using color that you want to drive a certain behavior, particularly on the web or in an application, you want to base it off of real world examples that people don't really have to think about because they already have them memorized. So again, if we see a big red button, we know that either don't hit it or we need to stop before we hit it and think, or we know it's going to have a big, potentially irreversible consequence. And finally, um, you know, color also affects mood and perception. Um, color can make you ha form an opinion about a company or a brand or a site uh, without really ever even interacting with it or, or really reading any of the content on it simply because of the associations we have with these colors. Now I will say kind of as a caution or as a caveat that you know of course these colors will not necessarily appear the same way to everybody. Uh, color blindness is something that affects in up to one in every 10 individuals and there are different forms of color blindness as well that you can look into. So, you know, red and green are very common colors to see on the web, but actually red and green is the most common form of color blindness as well. So as designers, we wanna be aware of what these colors mean, who can see these colors and, and what to do in case people can't see these colors. But for the next few slides, all I'm going to do is just flip through some images of some colors and I want you to just reflect on how they make you feel and try to think of what you would think if you saw this color on a website and if if you know there are certain websites that should or should not take advantage of these colors and their existing associations. So here we go. All right, and once again, thank you. Um, please contact your instructor if you have any questions. Thanks again.